Guys, we're just gonna wait um, about a minute or so for everyone to trickle in and then we'll get started. But thanks all for joining so far. I think we can um, get started. So hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for our 2020 Brand and Influencer Survey Key Insights panel today. We're super happy to have you here, um, especially since I know it's the first panel of the day and it might be a little bit early for some of us on the West Coast. Um, a couple of quick introductions. I'm Grace. I head up the content team here at Tribe Dynamics. Um, based in San Francisco, and I'll be taking you through the key findings of our 2020 brand and influencer survey that we conducted earlier this summer. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm one of the senior client partners um, based on the EMEA office for Tribe. Um, yeah, we're really excited to have you join us. Thank you for all the early joiners um, and then the kind of late afternooners here in the EMEA region. Um, as Grace takes you through the findings of our survey, I will be jumping in on some of the emergent trends um, just to talk you through some of the really interesting brand and influencer examples that we've seen to highlight this. Um, so yeah, excited to, to take you through our findings. Cool. One quick housekeeping point is as you think of questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to just put them in the chat box um, at the bottom of the screen. And then we'll carve out time at the end of our presentation to uh, chat through anything that, that you want to know. Awesome. Um, so to start off, to give some context, the last time that we conducted the State of the State Influencer Marketing Trend Survey was actually in the summer of 2017. So I think that's definitely when influencer marketing was still a much more nascent industry and many brands and influencers either still had to get into influencer marketing or were trying to figure out the rules of the game and strategies that we're really familiar with now like influencer product collaborations and like those tropical brand getaways that influencers went on they were still relatively new for a brand to include as part of the influencer marketing strategy. But then now, fast forward to 2020, um, I think we can all agree that influencer marketing is pretty much a given for any rising or established brand that wants to have an online presence at all and a successful business. And it also became pretty obvious to us that with new platforms like TikTok and also the COVID-19 pandemic and the protests for racial justice, but there couldn't really be a more fitting time to bring back the survey just to see how much influencer marketing has and hasn't changed um, in the face of so many other changes in our everyday and economic lives. So before we go over um, the survey's key findings and also the brand stories and the related takeaways, um, I want to let everyone know that if you are interested in reading the full report, which does have more data um, and insights than what's given in these slides or in today's presentation, um, or you can't stay for the whole panel, I definitely encourage you to visit tribedynamics.com slash insights. Um, and there you can download the full 2020 Influencer Marketing Trends Report, as well as um, a breadth of other research and data reports all for free. I think let's kick off with some basic details about the brand and influencer respondents that we surveyed. Um, so for this survey, which was done in July through August, we surveyed over 60 brand respondents and over 250 influencers. Um, and the brand spanned a variety of verticals, so that included beauty, um, skincare, fast fashion, luxury, fitness, health, and wellness. Um, and then in terms of location, the majority of branded influencers 
were based in the U.S. So 70% of brand respondents were based in the U.S. and 57% of influencer respondents were based in the U.S. And then of the brand respondents surveyed, 44% worked for an indie brand, while 56% worked for a corporate owned brand. So a roughly even split there. And of the influencers surveyed, 82% um, had under 50,000 followers, while 8% had over 100,000 followers. So there's a bit of a range there in terms of reach. 64% um, were employed part-time, while 36% were full-time influencers. And then looking at age, 53% were between 25 and 34, so somewhat younger millennials, while 15% were under 25, which means they fit squarely in Gen Z. And then the time frame that we focused on for all our questions was the past 12 months, so July of 2019 through June of 2020. So the first topic that we looked at for the survey was at the general growth of influencer marketing as an industry practice. Um, for those of you who might have feared that influencer marketing had already plateaued, um, the answer is that it hasn't. And personally, I'd say that influencer marketing is really all the more important now that brick and mortar shopping experiences um, have been way more limited. So of the brands that we surveyed, most of them reported that their influencer marketing teams had either remained the same size or grown over the past year. 41% um, of brands saw their team size expand, 40% saw their teams remain the same size, and 19% of teams contracted. And then let's talk a little bit about roadblocks. So even though influencer marketing has evolved so much within the past several years, and that means that probably a lot of issues and obstacles have been solved along the way. There definitely are still other obstacles that exist for brands um, when it comes to carrying out their influencer marketing program. So um, to be more specific, the top two roadblocks to brand success were inadequate manpower and inadequate budget. 59% um, of the respondents that we surveyed faced inadequate manpower, while 57% faced inadequate budget. And I think we can also tie these top roadblocks as likely contributing to the 19% of brands um, that did see their team sizes contract in the last 12 month, months. And also, I think looking at these um, top roadblocks, I think we can also infer that the potential and desire for influencer marketing to grow is still there. And then additionally, we also added a section about the role software tools that brands have been using to operationalize and scale their programs. So 80%, 81% of brands use between one and three software tools um, to help out their influencer marketing, while 14% don't use any, and 5% have four to six tools that they use to carry out their programs. Um, and the top problems that these software tools solve for brands include content tracking and campaign management, while the top problems that brands said that they still need tools for were influencer discovery and tracking emergent platforms. Um, but the brands that did list influencer discovery and tracking emergent platforms as some needs they still needed um, to solve were 16% of brands and 12% of brands res respectively. So I think looking at these relatively low percentages, um, we can also gather that there has been a high adoption of influencer management software and platforms in these past years. And then speaking of emerging platforms, I think that brings us perfectly to the next section of our presentation, um, which was serving brands and influencers about new and emerging platforms, namely Instagram stories and TikTok. So Instagram stories has become, I think we all know, an increasingly central component of the marketing strategies of brands and influencer content over the past few years. And then in the past year, TikTok um, has continued to expand its footprint with more and more brands dedicating resources to this fast growing platform. So of the brands that we surveyed, 78% of brands said that Instagram stories had very significantly impacted influencer content about the brand. And 65% said influencer stories had very significantly impacted how they approach brand activations. 
um, 88% of influencers regularly use Instagram stories and 63% of influencers have used Instagram stories much more frequently um, just within the past year. And then impressively, 35% of brands with dedicated influencer marketing teams for specific platforms now have teams for TikTok. Um, and I think another fun fact to note here is that when we also interviewed brands or surveyed brands on the order of the different channels in terms of importance to their influencer marketing strategy, TikTok actually ranked fourth after Instagram, IG stories, and YouTube, and before Facebook, Twitter, and any of the other channels. And then pretty much hand in hand, um, about 35% of influencers have used TikTok more frequently within the past year. So it's definitely not a platform or a trend that should be seen as a fad or just for a certain demographic. And um, I think some of you may have caught um, our TikTok marketing playbook pa panel in yesterday's um, summit panels as well, but we really stress there that TikTok is seen as a sort of edutainment um, channel, which I think is especially useful and fitting during uh, uh, more stressful times like now. Cool. Um, yeah, we've seen a huge upward trends for brands in terms of the volume of content that's produced on Instagram stories, as Grace mentions. Um, and they're now really an established part of any successful strategy on Instagram. And as Grace says, it's super exciting to see what's been happening on TikTok this year. Um, something that's been sticking out to us is that brands that are really letting this entirely new generation of influencers be their best creative director and really lean into their aesthetic are the types of brands and the types of campaigns that are really doing the best and are winning on the platform currently because it's this new TikTok generation of influencers who really understand their audience. Um, so some initial call outs. And again, I know these were discussed in the panel um, hosted yesterday by Riley and Michelle from Tribe as well on TikTok, but has to be ELF. Um, it's a beauty brand that took some really early risks on TikTok that totally paid off. Um, the first of which was when they partnered with the creative agency Movers and Shakers and created the song that now is so well known. It went completely viral on the platform, but it was titled Eyes, Lips, Face um, for the initial hashtag Eyes, Lips, Face campaign and challenge. Um, so they partnered with really popular TikTok creators for this first launch, which totally blew up. And then we were hit with COVID-19 uh, later on in the year. Um, and the team moved really kind of swiftly and actually repurposed the um, hashtag eyes, lips, face challenge to hashtag eyes, lips, face safe, um, remixing the song um, to kind of mention proper hand washing, social distancing practices. Um, so a combination of um, these campaigns drove a lot of amazing and very exciting content. Um, and drove a total of 1.9 million in EMV. For those of you who are new to us at Tribe Dynamics, just very quickly, EMV uh, is earned media value and it's our proprietary metric that measures the online engagement of influencer content. And then one more example that I just want to touch on in terms of things we've seen on TikTok is actually a shout out to Benefit. They've really kind of mobilized in terms of their owned account which is at benefit cosmetics and they consistently feature their own internal staff their social media team in a really kind of fun light-hearted and playful way and i think it just alongside all of the earned content that goes on around uh, around them it just makes the brand even more relatable and authentic so kind of earned and owned going hand in hand there TikTok's been amazing to watch, and I think we'll continue to see some pretty exciting stuff on the channel. And then obviously Instagram Reels launched last month. So again, just exciting to see brands and influencers mobilizing in this space too. Um, and now Grace, I'll pass it back to you for our next trend. Cool. So I think now we're gonna move on to something that hasn't changed so much over the past several years. Um, we surveyed influencers and brands about the role that products and product sends play in influencer marketing. And it was pretty clear that regardless of how much the mediums of influencer marketing or content creation have changed, 
content creators rated product quality as the number one factor in determining whether or not they would post about a brand. Um, and the opportunity to try and review new products is a central component of a brand relationship building effort with influencers. And also opportunities to try new products were the number one reason that influencers created content about events. So what that means is that you can have the best influencer marketing strategy, but none of that really matters if your products don't match what an influencer is looking for or isn't something they feel is special enough or worth sharing with their followers and fellow influencers. So looking at product sends and product collaborations of the brands and influencers that we surveyed, 90% of influencers said receiving new product launches or more new product launches would improve their experience working with brands. 92% um, of brands had orchestrated a product send within the past year. And then product collaborations were the number one way influencers said brands could empower them in their careers. But 22% of brands, um, or only 22% of brands had released a product in collaboration with an influencer within the past year. So for any brands um, that might be afraid that influencer product collaborations are a tired trend of the past, um, I think rest assured that it isn't something worth fearing. Great, yeah, I mean, to mirror that, I think in a time when purchase power is low, securing consumers' faith in hero and quality products has really never been more important. So we've continued to see some really exciting influencer and brand collaborations um, and really robust mailer programs um, just to promote and celebrate brands kind of winning quality products. Um, Grace, as you mentioned, although it happened to a lesser degree this year, probably because of everything that's been going on externally, one of the most tried and true methods for content generation, consumer engagement, um, is the brand influencer collaboration. Um, it also sparks momentum on social and EMV. And although we've seen less, they're still ongoing. So some really exciting partnerships that we've seen this year. Uh, the first call out goes to Morphe and their collab with Pony Park. Um, Pony is a super cool South Korean YouTuber. And I think Morphe is probably very well known for some of its amazing influencer collabs, but mainly working with kind of powerhouse US influencers. So collabing here with Pony is a step towards a really international strategy. Already, the Pony collection has netted 24.6 million in EMV. Um, and then another collab I'd like to call out is Fabletics. They um, partnered with Demi Lovato in April. And as part of the collaboration, both parties pledged a percent of the collections would go directly to COVID-19 relief funds or related charities. The hashtag Demi for Fabletics netted 1.3 million in EMV and is one of the brand's top 15 hashtags in the period that we ran the survey. Um, so this proves that product collaborations can serve as a really great way for brands to address contemporary issues and crises head on uh, in a really positive manner. And then um, I don't feel it would be right to not call out uh, ELF again for their unconventional but very playful collab with Chipotle, um, which killed it on TikTok. It featured a, their makeup kit in a, a bag that resembled the foil wrapped burrito. Chipotle have also, on a side note, been doing some really interesting uh, things in the TikTok space as well. Um, so it, in a way it was like a perfect, perfect kind of synergy um, and actually just furthered ELF's ongoing marketing efforts on TikTok. So that's collabs. Mailer programs um, have been all the more important because brands need to support their communities and get products into their hands when we can't see each other in person. Um, but some themes that we've been talking about this year um, is actually things like sustainability in terms of how brands are packaging and sending products out and kind of minimalizing waste. A call out here would be to the Bare Minerals um, brand. Uh, they recently sent out and launched their skin longevity line. And as part of this, their community received these beautiful but quite pared back silver pouches. 
Um, they were filled with the Skin Longevity product range and then an individually matched original foundation. So just a really considered mailer that doesn't necessarily involve all of the on back unboxing um, and kind of excess material of maybe collabs in years gone by or mailers in years gone by, sorry. Um, and then a third kind of separate route, but something worth calling out, uh, the powerhouse uh, influencer James Charles hosted the biggest virtual collab in history on his own channel uh, on YouTube back in May. He brought together uh, his friends from the beauty community. Um, so it was other powerhouse influencers like Nikki Tutorials and Patrick Starr, all of them hosting part of the kind of um, clip to show which of their hero products they use on which part of the face. So again, really sort of selling the power of quality products and favorites um, at a time where we can't get together in person. So next, um, relatedly, sponsorship or sponsored content doesn't ne negate authenticity. So while influencers highly value the personal connection and relationships that brands may foster with them, and I know we're always stressing that creating personal relationships is something that brands should definitely do with influencers, that doesn't mean that influencers don't want a business relationship as well. So as the influencer marketing industry has matured, financially compensating influencers has become an increasingly mainstream practice and brands and consumers can remain assured that influencers don't accept payment from brands they don't support. So to back that up with some data, 78% of influencers said sponsorship played a role in their decision to work with brands and influencers were more satisfied with brands that they created the most paid content for than the brands that they create the most unpaid content for. And the vast majority of influencers only post about brands with products that they enjoy. So 28% of influencers said they only work with brands that they genuinely love, so their favorite brands. And 66% said they were willing to work with brands outside of their like very favorite brands, but they still had to like their products. And then looking at the brand side, um, most brands, so 65%, said the proportion of influencers they compensated had increased. And overall, 93% of brands have compensated content creators within the past year, but more than half paid under 50% of the influencers they worked with, while 41% paid over 50%. So I think we can definitely expect to see it that um, influencer marketing um, as basically a financial career um, will only grow more in these coming years. And then next, moving on to a section of the survey that we definitely didn't have in the 2017 version of our report, um, but have certainly all been profoundly affected by in the past year, which is the impact of COVID-19 on influencer marketing and influencer content creation. So we spoke to these trends in the early days of the pandemic um, in our first EARN Summit, but according to our survey as well, COVID-19 has changed but not diminished content creation. So 62% of influencers said that they posted the same amount of content or more content than before since the lockdowns began. And with regard to the changes in the content that influencers have published, 72% um, of influencers are sharing more at-home content. Relatedly, 51% of influencers are sharing more self-care content. And 44% of influencers are only posting about products they feel are worth the cost. So this reinforces the fact that product quality as well as product relevancy really needs to remain a top priority for brands when developing new products for their consumers. Yeah, jumping in here because it would obviously be impossible to talk about a 2020 influencer marketing report without talking about COVID-19 um, and its impact on posting habits and the industry widely. In many ways, the pandemic succeeded in bringing communities together uh, and connected them when people were really craving connection, um, cheer and entertainment. And I think the increase in online traffic from audiences at home presented new opportunities for brands. Um, right at the start of confinement and lockdown, 
influencers had more time to create small scale content um, and could kind of pivot to uh, showing aspects of their daily lives that normally wouldn't have made up their grid. Now, we're still not really traveling. Um, so influencers are able to attend multiple Zooms or digital activations in a day. They have that kind of time back. Uh, engagement's still up and their followers crave content. So I think initial brand responses at the very start of COVID were a lot of pledges of support on owned channels. So we saw that across beauty brands, across fashion brands and wellness brands. Um, we saw pledges of support and donations as well. So lots of the big luxury players like Gucci, Ralph Lauren, Burberry. Um, so we kind of see that on our, on our feeds from their owned channels. And then some teams were able to mobilize quite quickly and send out care packages. Ted Baker um, managed to gather together a really nice bundle, which included a water bottle and a hoodie and kind of get those products out to just boost their community. Uh, now we've moved forward and brands are kind of gifting face masks, etc. We've obviously come quite away from that initial point. Um, and something that stands out as a central part of brand strategies at the moment is how they can activate and engage uh, with their community in the virtual space. So a few shout outs here. Um, NARS, they've been hosting some really lovely kind of virtual events and happy hours. They launched their bronzing collection in the summer. So their influencers uh, were sent uh, an invitation the hour section needs to be packaged, uh, their poison of choice to drink on the night, and then bronze cocktail glasses and a matching shaker. Um, Joe Malone have been hosting breakfasts with artisans. Um, the artisans will lead workshops uh, that range from candle making to crap flower arranging. Dior Germany did something super nice, um, kind of in the digital space purely, where um, their consumers could send digital kisses in select shades to one another on Instagram with the chance to win the look lipstick as a result of the post. Um, and then some other cool digital partnerships that we've seen. Tatcha, the skincare brand, uh, early on in confinement, they gifted um, a free subscription to the wellness and mental health app Calm to their community. Um, and then Tatcha again, and actually a lot of other brands, we've seen a lot of luxury brands, um, Givenchy Beauty, have also partnered with the huge gaming platform Animal Crossing. Um, it's got a huge usership. Um, and I think it's a place where kind of communities can gather together to feel right, light, light relief and escapism. And then obviously interact in some way with the brands that they love, whether it's visiting a repurposed island, um, et cetera. And then some fashion call outs. We saw some early creative pivots from brands so that they could capitalize on the stay at home economy. One of my favorites um, was watching Jacques Mousse. So they launched their hashtag Jacques Mousse at home, which then spiraled into a playful challenge. Um, the brand would showcase pieces from their spring summer 2020 collection and team them in a literal piece of portraiture with crockery, uh, plates, knives, flowers from the garden, things that you could find at home. Um, and then as a result, their audiences would do the same. So just kind of a super fun um, touch point there. Now we're seeing brands experimenting with virtual replacements uh, amidst fashion week, for example, and a lot of um, brands and fast fashion brands as well are blending together digital events. So how you can combine some element of in real life with digital. Burberry just last week um, over London Fashion Week became the first luxury fashion brand to partner with the gaming platform Twitch. They streamed their fashion show on the channel. Um, the show happened in real life with no audience there, but their community were sent a link so that they could enjoy the show at home in a really kind of leveraged and luxury way. So yeah, just some call outs there from, from this trend that we've seen. So now finally, the one topic that we also wanna be able to gloss over in this survey is the impact that the widespread protests against racial injustice we've all seen have had on the marketing practices of brands as well as the content creation practices of influencers. So when asked if they had taken initiative over the past year to empower BIPOC content creators, 
91% of brands said that they had taken some or a number of actions regarding BIPOC empowerment. So this included sending product to more BIPOC influencers, including more BIPOC models and influencers in marketing campaigns, and including more BIPOC influencers in brand initiatives. And then looking at the influencer side, when influencers were surveyed, 31% of influencers said they have felt overlooked or excluded from a brand activation due to their race or ethnicity in the past year. 25% um, of influencers said they have felt inadequately compensated due to their race or ethnicity. And 23% felt that their race or ethnicity had been a significant barrier to their success. Um, additionally, 69% of influencers said that a company's values are quote unquote very important in their decision to talk about a brand, and 72% use their platform to promote social justice causes within the past year. And to give more context on those figures, 26% um, of influencer respondents identified as BIPOC, 19% prefer not to disclose their racial identity, and just 55% identified as white, which emphasizes even more how often non-white influencers can feel that they're disadvantaged when it comes to making a career of being an influencer. And in turn, that also emphasizes how important it is for brands to proactively work at making their businesses, their products, and their marketing feel more inclusive. Yeah, to echo all of that, 2020 seen such a huge shift towards our focus on social and moral responsibility. Um, and in social media space that starts with brands and the messages that they're putting out. Um, obviously we saw heightened engagement at the beginning of the pandemic, um, then during the end of May to June and the tragic death of George Floyd in the US, we saw content creators and brand alike turn to their social to learn, to educate, donate and use their influence to spread the message that Black Lives Matter. There's been such a shift in the effort that people and brands and influencers are putting in to make these really desperately needed changes. And I think young consumers are really demanding now that brands take action and be held accountable. So as mentioned in June, we saw beauty, lifestyle and fashion influencers adjust their content creation to amplify the um, anti-racism movement, support black leaders, creators, uh, and black owned brands. And this was a trend that we saw then reflected in our June EMV rankings. Um, I think influencers also stood up to promote uh, fellow kind of um, community members from the BIPOC community and also black owned businesses. And were really encouraging their followers not to only post about the movement, but also use the power of their dollar um, to support and get behind it. We also saw some global beauty influencers like Nikki Tutorials, Jamie Genevieve, um, Marion Moretti, just to name a few, who created makeup looks using only black owned makeup brands. Um, a makeup challenge, if we call it this, um, this kind of similar thing was actually created by Jackie Ina in 2006. But these challenges resurgence drove monumental EMV growth for black owned brands like Uoma Beauty, Mented Cosmetics, Danessa Mirix Beauty and Beauty Bakery. And if any of us haven't heard of them, we should all check them out. And then fashion brands like Lounge Underwear and Fenty and influencer accolades for their various initiatives supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and black creators. Um, we have in the last few months seen a whole host of brands really vocally support the movement on their own channels. Um, also start to look internally at their company structure and then also at their long term influencer strategies and partnerships. So this isn't just a response um, to an event in June. This is going to be like a long term permanent change for these brands, which is great. But obviously the work here has only really just begun. Thanks, Hannah. So now moving on to our brand takeaways um, for 2020, uh, but also beyond. So we learned a lot from this branded influencer survey that we conducted, and we also hope you did too. And we like to wrap up this portion of the presentation by just leaving you with a few key takeaways that brands of any vertical and not just in beauty, fashion, or lifestyle can keep in mind um, as best practices when they're planning their influencer marketing strategy. So first to start off, 
make sure you're consistently conducting personalized outreach, um, but make sure to respect influencers as professionals. So according to our survey, many influencers feel that they still lack a close connection to the brands they work with, um, both those that they have a business relationship with and those that they don't. Um, to help remedy that, brands can inspire more genuine and impactful content creation by getting to know influencers on a personal level and also demonstrating a deep respect for their work. And the two, make product quality your number one priority. So influencers care about product quality above all else, as we've seen, um, and take content creators feedback into account and actively involve them in the product development process. And both influencers and their audiences will be engaged and grateful. Um, three, keep on innovating to adapt to COVID-19. So of course, this is something that brands and influencers and all of us have already been doing. Um, but I think we can be in agreement that the pre-pandemic world as we know it isn't coming back anytime soon. So in the meantime, embrace the at-home aesthetic and identify virtual outreach opportunities to continue to drive success. And then also think about the sort of advantages of marketing strategies that you've used during um, like the time of shelter in place and during the pandemic that can actually carry um, into a post-pandemic world as well. And then finally, um, super important, invest in long-term diversity. So now more than ever, influencers and consumers are championing brands that demonstrate a real commitment to inclusion and then eschewing those that don't. So dedicate resources to pro promoting diversity, both in your influencer outreach and also in your internal team, including the key decision makers to retain the support of your influencers and their followers. And then um, last but not least, I hope you guys um, did enjoy and find this presentation insightful today. And so if you do wanna view the full report, um, again, you can visit trydynamics.com slash insights to download the report there and also just see all our other influencer marketing resources or check out our software services. And then um, in case you didn't know, we also have a bi-weekly podcast that's also called Earned. And if you tune into that, you can base, you can get um, a look into both successful brands and their creators that have really found an influencer marketing strategy that works for them. Cool. And as promised, we will now um, pull up the Q and A's um, and just answer any questions that have come through. So we've received this one here. Do you have your eyes on any new emerging social media platforms that you think will become the next big phenomenon? Um, Grace, I'll, I'm happy to jump in here. Obviously, as mentioned, we saw Instagram Reels launch last month, um, but I've been seeing kind of quite a lot about the platform Twitch. And obviously, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, it was interesting to see that Burberry chose Twitch, which I believe is Amazon owned and is a gaming platform, but that was the platform that they chose to um, stream their runway show. So I think I'd definitely be interested to keep, keep my eye on that. Yeah, agreed. I think even though live streaming isn't as um, prominent as some new channels like TikTok, it seems like with the pandemic, um, those have definitely been implemented, implemented more, um, also with the advent of virtual events. Cool. Anyone else for any other questions? So far, we've just had this one come through. And we don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, it goes without saying, if there's anything left unanswered by today or anything that you would like to ask Grace or I, please feel free to, to contact us directly. Ah, okay, one more. Who should my brand choose to collaborate with on a product? Grace, do you wanna kick off there? Yeah, I can definitely kick it off. Um, I think looking at some of the successful brand examples that we've seen, the most important um, thing to look for first is an influencer that has a long history 
um, with your brand and sharing about your brand, talking about your brand, liking your brand's products. I think familiar, familiarity definitely um, also primes then their followers to know that this is an authentic collaboration and often because influencers look to their followers for input into these um, product collaborations, um, making sure that the, the influencer has had a long history um, of talking about your brand is especially critical. Definitely. Um, and on that, I think next port of call, particularly if you're a new brand, um, is to look at targeting your competitors or brands that you think share a kind of DNA that with, with yours um, and also competitor products as well. Um, so, you know, who has a similar product in line with whatever it is you're launching, which influencers are posting and loving that kind of product because chances are they'll fit really well with your brand and whatever it is that you're launching. Um, we've had another question here, which ultra luxury brand do you think is using TikTok well? Um, I'll start if that's okay, Grace. Yeah, we've ahead. seen a lot of interesting um, movement from the luxury players, um, particularly again, like I'm going to call out Jacques Mousse here. Um, we've seen Burberry doing some interesting things, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, um, but I think one big leap, a lot of this is happening on their own channels. And I think it's almost a leap of faith to um, kind of launch a TikTok campaign because the most success will really rely on you coming up with um, a brief that you're willing to hand over to this very kind of nascent breed of influencer and let them make the campaign what they will. Um, and I think perhaps it's fair to say that as an ultra luxury brand, that's harder whilst you're trying to juggle kind of um, brand heritage DNA. So I think it's an interesting opportunity, but definitely, yeah, the brands that I've just mentioned, we've seen doing some really cool things um, in the space to date. Cool, next one. Um, any feedback on Zoom fatigue for virtual events and how to keep them fresh? Again, I'm happy to start on this one. Um, I think there is Zoom fatigue is a thing and there are so many events going into uh, influencers diaries at the moment. So my top tips and most of you guys online will be the experts as the brands, but are to keep it really kind of considered, make your outreach as personal as you can, have an original concept, make sure it's like authentic to your brand and your product. Don't go really left field and do something that feels jarring with who you are just because you're trying to host a virtual event. If you're thinking of doing that, save yourself the time and budget and planning um, and just come up with something with a community that you know love you um, and doing something that feels personal to them and whatever the kind of product or collection is that you're launching. Um, and then one more here. Do you recommend any specific platform for influencer search? Grace, you want to jump in there or? I can jump. Influencer search. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, we, we can do a shameless plug for Tribe yeah. Dynamics here. <laughs> do, we, yeah, do we mean Tribe Dynamics influencer search? Yeah, yeah. we yeah. have um, a tool search, which if yeah. you're signed up to receive our services, basically allows you to search through our entire database of influencers of whichever market you're in. And you can search through all of the brands that we track, which are thousands across the beauty, fashion and wellness space. Um, and the top 1000 talked about hashtags on a daily basis. So it's a great starting point for building a community from scratch or targeting new influencers. I hope that answered the question. Um, we probably have time for one more. What's your view on Triller? which Charlie D'Amelio has joined. Um, I'm going to be honest. I have not heard of Triller yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm also, yeah, me, I'm not Gen Z enough to have. I know, but yeah, thank no, you. I'm look into it. Definitely. Um, this is why these, these Q&As are great. We'll definitely have a look at the, the platform. I think it's exciting that 2020 has just offered so many new um, platforms. 
Um, so yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll have a look at this. Yeah. And yeah, again, I know we went through a lot of data, a lot of insights today. So that is all available online for you to read through as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Grace. Thank you. Bye.